Well, the TSX has been hanging around one month lows. It has tried and failed about five times, I think, in the past uh, year to break meaningfully above that 20,000 level. Our next guest is looking for a pullback, but says you could find some opportunities in beaten up sectors. Let's bring in Sam LaBelle. He's portfolio manager at Veritas Asset Management. Sam, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So we've been looking at the TSX as an index, technically struggling to break out, but we have seen some try to call for outperformance of the TSX based on cyclical interest and value. What do you think? Well, there's definitely a value component. The TSX is at a very low multiple. I would say that the, the S&P at 20 times, 20 times and TSX at 14, that's a very attractive multiple. But I think you also have to strip out the oversized impact of this sort of this magnificent seven in the in the yes. US. And a lot of those other multiples outside of the magnificent seven are, are quite a bit lower. Um, but really what we're looking at, we always look forward, try to look forward to, to see what's going to happen rather than skate where the puck is, has been. You skate where the puck is going, as Gretzky says. Um, and we think that one of the big challenges that we have with this market is that the market has run up quite a bit this year on very little forward earnings growth. So if you compare where forward earnings are on the, on the S&P 500 to where they were at the beginning of the year, they're up about 4%. And that's really just on a roll forward of two quarters to the next 12 months. So that's not really explaining the movement here. It's all about multiple expansion. Yeah. And the multiple expansion rests on a lot of hopes. And I think everyone would agree that it's, it's a story driven uh, momentum play here on, on AI and what it could do for the economy and what it could do for some of the companies. That's a very long term play. So we see a lot of risk in that that particular uh, story. The U.S. has the Magnificent Seven. We have a Magnificent One. That's Shopify, right. which has done uh, extremely well. Is this one that you would, I guess, include in your list of, of names that you're cautious about? So the biggest challenge for Shopify is how do you value this company? So you can do the usual business school math where you say, okay, the, the sales for next year, $6.95 billion is the estimate, U.S., and let's grow that at 30% for 10 years and then give it an, an, an Amazon-like exit multiple of 2.2 times sales. If I do that mass and discount it back to present value at 9%, cost of equity, I get about 10% higher than where it's currently trading, about $78 billion uh, valuation. But if I put 25% into my figures, it's about 25% overvalued. You mean 25% growth. 25% growth so for 10 years. So you're wrong about growth. Maybe you've right. overshot, so you bring it down a bit. So the question is, can Shopify continue to over-index the e-commerce segment? We saw a Walmart report today. They had 24% year-over-year e-commerce growth. That's a very big number for Walmart and kind of indicative of where e-commerce is growing at. E-commerce is not growing at the same rates it was before. And one of the challenges is there's big parts of the retail space that, like automotive, where you still have to come into the store mm -hmm. to, to do your buying. So e-commerce will not penetrate all segments of the market. It's really driven off of what people want to buy online. And so that, to us, is the biggest risk. You have to answer a lot of questions about Shopify's business model. Where is the revenue growth going to come from? Is it going to come from payments? Is it going to come from other services? They've gotten out of the logistics business uh, by selling off, off their logistics acquisition, and that was a major impairment in the most recent quarter. So you have a lot of questions about where the growth comes from, what, what rate, and that's what makes growth stocks so tricky. Uh, Shopify's up. Yeah. Basically 60% as of yesterday, 60% on the year, but it's dropped 18% uh, since the beginning of, of July, I believe. So, and, and growth is forecast to slow below 20%. Right. So that's, that's the challenge we have with growth stocks. And that's not to say don't own in, any in your portfolio, but you really have to have a lot of conviction on Shopify's business model and, and future prospects. Okay, Mr. Value. So then what do you think about our bank stocks, which are set to report next week? They are historically discounted relative to, you know, their own typically where they trade. You get a very nice dividend yield. What do you think? So we see a lot of challenges coming ahead for banks. Uh, if you look at the financial sector review is something that the Bank of Canada puts out looking at all the financial conditions in Canada. And they had some really good information on the ro rollover of the mortgage book for Canadians. Uh, you're looking at it, roughly a fifth of the ro mortgage book will roll over this year. And for the variable portion of that rollover, it's up 50%. The costs on the mortgage are up 50%. For the, those, that's the pure variable with a variable rate. The variable with a fixed rate, uh, is a fixed payment, rather. 
that's going to be up about 25% in terms of cost year over year, and the rest of the book is somewhere between 15 and 25%. So you see another fifth rolling over next year and okay. another fifth in 2025, and even now, all that analysis was done before additional rate hikes. So you're seeing a lot of pressure on the Canadian household sector uh, from mortgage rates. Um, you know, Keynes says everybody, every, in the long run, we're all dead. Well, in Canada, the long, in the long run, we're all variable. Basically, yeah. we are all on five year, even if it's fixed, you gotta roll it at five years. That's right. And it's a very different picture than from what you see in the United States where they can get 30 year mortgages. And that has its own kind of weird effects because what's happening in the United States is people are sitting on their 30 year mortgage. They don't roll over to any higher rate. They just don't move. So the resale activity has dropped in the US and that has, has led to a lot of home building and a lot of stimulus on the economic side. We don't have any of that. We're actually seeing slowdowns in the housing market and slowdown in credit growth. And so the expectation is that the bank's top line is going to start slowing down very dramatically. It has been growing at about 9%, mm -hmm. uh, high single digits. That's sort of the average of the big six. Uh, and that's going to slow to flat to 2%. So you, got, you don't have the growth in the top line. You've got potentially credit conditions picking up and PCLs, provisions for credit losses, picking up. So there's a lot of margin pressure on the banks. My, my response will be it's already priced in. Well, one of the challenges is I, I, I don't believe it's ever priced in. When earnings go down, people react. So I think people are looking ahead and saying, OK, well, it can't, it can't get that bad. And what we do really at Veritas is a, is a deep dive. We have a great analyst, Nigel D'Souza, mm -hmm. who gets into the details of the bank's assumptions on how they book the provision for, for credit loss. And that's one thing to remember. It's not an actual number until it becomes an actual number. They actually have to book the losses and then kind of move them through the stages of IFRS to get to the actual loss, the eventual loss. So have they taken enough provisions? We don't think that they have because the macro assumptions built into those provisions are quite... Uh, benign and favorable. Okay, so I promised our viewers some long ideas. Where are you finding some hope uh, in the equity markets? I think our producer said REITs. Yeah, so the interesting thing is if you're not in banks, which is 20% of the index is big six banks and 30% is financials, if you're not in banks, then what are you moving into? And so we want some assets that have a similar profile in terms of risk and yield. And so we, li we like the consumer staples space, we like the REIT space, we like the utility space. In staples, the grocers have been doing very well. And one of the things that happens if there is a slowdown is people eat out less, they go to the grocery store, they spend more. And, and food inflation is coming down. And food inflation is coming down. That's actually good for the grocers. They're still is able it? to, prices are sticky. So okay. they keep the prices where they are, their input costs come down a little bit, margins improve. Um, Except they've all been up there in their quarterly results saying first paragraph and our margins got worse because they were hauled up to Parliament Hill to talk about the yes, fact that they're they, not they, inflation. Yeah, they don't like to talk about having good margins. Obviously, that's that's taboo. But um, there are some pressures on the labor side we're seeing with the strike at Metro, yeah. but we think they can work through that. And there's efficiencies that they can still find in the operations to grow those those earnings. And they're growing at double digits. In so Loblaws, Metro are our top picks there. In, in, in the REIT space, to go back to that, a lot of jitters about, you know, commercial, return to work, um, even the consumer, you yes. know, sh sh uh, all these big retailers leaving Canada. How are you thinking about that? So we would avoid, avoid the office side of the equation. Okay, but you're still not going in. A lot of the Canadian REIT space is, is residential REITs and it's commercial REITs. Uh, we do like uh, RioCan, and mainly with RioCan, it's the fact that they're going to bring on a, a lot of retail space over the next couple of years. So they have an investment portfolio that's going to deliver returns and start earning in the next three years that they're moving into. They're growing their net operating income in, in the low single digits. That's good. That's good. But there's an undervalued portfolio of investments here that aren't even in the uh, investors' perceptions of Rio Can, so we think it's undervalued. You know, it's a dividend yield of 5.5%, and I can't believe I'm saying that, but that doesn't seem impressive these days. You know, is it enough to entice you for the risk that the stock could fall? Well, we think that it, going back to our, our long-term thesis on what could play out in Canada, if the consumer is weak, the economy is a little bit weaker, there's going to be a pause to a slowing of rate hikes, per, perhaps a rate cut in the next year. And that's going to shore up the prices of these REITs. They have been under pressure as rates rise. Of course, they're a yield product, and they, they do come under a bit of pressure. But we think that's, that's something that could actually work in their favor as rates pause or, or start to reverse. As rates pause or start to reverse, is that 
is that your base case? Because I think yes, investors there may, are getting nervous about that. There today. may be another small hike coming, mm -hmm. but ultimately it, they said they're going to respond to the data. In Canada, the data is going to get a bit softer. Uh, the, the U.S. is still racing ahead, and there's, there's a reason we can discuss about that, and that has to do with the fact that the savings rate is quite low and people are just spending yeah. spending a lot more out of their income than they were prior to the pandemic. Um, I want to, just before we go to break, um, utilities has been a beaten up sector back to where it was in 2020. Um, you're picking up some exposure here? Yeah, so regulated utilities have the benefit that they are guaranteed a return through the regulator. and. Uh, there's been a big shift, of course, towards green energy, and a lot of these renewable plays got a lot of interest, and the stocks ran up, they ran back down. Yeah. We like the companies that have an established management team that are good at operating their assets, good at, at, at capital discipline. So Fortis, Transalta, Capital Power, they've got a discipline to apply to the, to the renewables uh, world. And there's, there's an effect here as we go more green, the marginal cost of new energy goes up. If you own installed assets, those assets tend to be worth more. The rates have gone up. Uh, there's lots of structural reasons for that, but the Alberta power prices are quite a bit higher than they were. And so that's a benefit to a lot of these, these uh, utilities. All right, we're gonna